Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Back in May, I gave a presentation on several different schismatic groups, some that date to the time of Joseph Smith, and some that are very current, uh, so brand new. So, uh, this is a presentation I gave, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thanks a lot. All right, well, let's see if I can share my screen here. Can you guys see this here? Yes. All right. So uh, we're going to go on a tour of the restoration. Um, it's been fun for the past six years. I've been talking to people from all a lot of different groups. I'm trying to. There we go. And so uh, some of my favorite people to talk to are pictured here: John Hamer, Neil Bringhurst, and Steve Shields. Um, they've written some great books on the topic of the restoration. Um, John Hamer and Neil Bringhurst on the left uh, put together Scattering of the Saints, Schism Within Mormonism, which is a fantastic book. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that cover in just a moment, because um, it's not just a bunch of cool little circles. It's, it uh, has some pretty cool explanations. It's not comprehensive, though. Uh, if you want a comprehensive history of or a very uh, encyclopedia of uh, of mormonism you've got to get the book uh, divergent paths of the restoration so uh, steve shields uh he's a member of the community of christ as most of you probably already know and it's available there it's it's actually electronic version only um the book is so large they couldn't actually get it into a book and so uh it's kind of nice to have it in electronic form because uh you can search and there's there's over 500. Um, he doesn't like to use the word schisms. Uh, I'm going to use it, but uh, so he refers to them as expressions of Mormonism. So two fantastic books uh, and all three of these guys are probably smarter than me. So I'm just kind of relying on their uh, expertise, but as well as some of my own uh, uh interviews and, and as well. So um, we'll, I want to talk a little bit about John Hamer's book there. John's a, an, an amazing graphic artist and uh, he's actually color coded these groups. And so if you look at the top, you'll see, I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, at the top there. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, we can. Yep. Okay. So you've got Joseph Smith Jr. And you'll notice that's a blue circle in New York. And then just below it, you've got Joseph Smith Jr. is a green circle in Kirtland. And the idea between the color changes is these represent theological differences. And so you can see that any of these blue circles like Warren Parrish, uh, Wycombe Clark, and John Whitmer have tried to return back to the original New York style theology. And so you can kind of see here as Joseph moves down here to come down the main trunk of this well it's not really a tree but kind of whatever octopus thing here uh then it turns to a kind of a light green in far west and then orange in nauvoo and then you can kind of see this main these big circles here uh after joseph smith dies the 12 take over and then brigham young in this main branch takes over and then john taylor and they're kind of some red and yellow. And then we go on to Gordon B. Hinckley. Of course, he was the prophet of the LDS church when John finished this book. And so the idea here is when you look at these colors, you can kind of see which, um, which branch. So over here on the left, you've got James Strang, which is kind of a pinkish color. And then he turns into kind of more of a purple color. And you can see he's got some breakoffs here. Um, the uh, Joseph Smith, as we go back to, um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how. So there's not a direct connection, which is kind of interesting in this thing. If you go from Joseph Smith to William Smith and then Jesse Briggs and over here over to, this is the kind of the RLDS branch. And, and you can see a lot, a lot of these innovations here, they're, they've kind of returned back to the Kirtland era theology that's why those are, are more in green um, in the in the blue you have uh, kind of the Sydney Rigdon group where they're trying to get back to New York and William Bickerton and that sort of stuff and so anyway it's not just a bunch of cool colors uh, John's really thought about this a lot and over here in kind of the army green you've got uh, William Draves unfortunately I haven't been able to talk to anybody I do have an interview scheduled with a guy named Adam Stokes but uh, 
that'll be maybe in a future presentation to talk a little bit about this branch. That's the Elijah message branch, which is kind of interesting. So anyway, yeah. So blue, green, orange, pink, and then brown. That's, that's kind of the, the main sort of colors. And you can see when we get into the dark red, that's, those are really kind of some of the polygamous groups as well. So uh, moving on, this slide comes from John Hamer. Um, it's a fantastic uh, slide. And so I want to talk first about, we're going to talk not only about early schisms, but we're going to talk about later schisms uh, of the recent past. Um, and so you'll notice these green and brown and orange and yellow, these match the um, colors that, that John was representing previously. So he's got nine possible successors of Joseph Smith here. Of course, the LDS church, the Brighamites and the RLDS church, the Josephites, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I think we're all pretty familiar. <laughs> Most of us are either LDS or RLDS here um, or are very familiar with those. So William Smith's kind of interesting. He joined with several groups. He joined with James Strangs for a time. Um, he started his own church for a time and ended up in the RLDS church. Um, if you, there's a link there, I believe that was uh, with Stephen uh, Shields that I talked to a little bit about that. William Marks had a claim to the um, succession, but he, he first supported Sidney Rigdon's claim, and then he ended up joining the, the RLDS church. Um, David Whitmer's church is no longer extant, and um, I believe it lasted up to the 60s, if I remember right. Um Lyman White, he's another quite a character. Um, he's in brown here. His church is no longer extant. Now the, I put a little yellow line here because this is where I'm going to start talking about some of these people. Um, and uh, so I had a really interesting interview with Mel Johnson to find out more about the what we kind of call the Whiteites. And you'll see with every with all these churches, a lot of them use the same names, and so that's why we refer to the LDS churches, the Brighamites, and the Josephites, and the Williamites, and the Whiteites, and everything, because it just makes it a little bit easier to say who was the person that kind of started that branch. Um, some of the others were James Strang, um, Sidney Rigdon, and William Bickerton. Um, Rigdon's on here. Bickerton kind of took over. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Alpheus Cutler, <clears throat> and then there's one that's not pictured, but I wanted to put it on here. Um, and that's Granville Hedrick, and he uh, was with the Church of Christ Temple Lot, which if you're an independent, you're probably familiar with them. Um, so I, when I look at this slide from John Hamer, <laughs> Granville Hedrick really didn't have a claim to, to leadership as, as these nine all had some sort of a claim. And so, um, but Granville Hedrick, well, I'll talk about him in a minute, but he knew Joseph Smith. He was baptized just before Joseph Smith's um, death. So we'll move on. First one here that we're going to talk about, and these aren't in any particular order, is Lyman White. A lot of times we refer to them as the Whiteites. Um, and so he... Uh, he was an apostle. Um, he spent some time in Liberty Jail with Joseph Smith. Um, and then when Joseph Smith died, um, he, he had been commissioned to first go to Wisconsin. And then um, once he was done with Wisconsin, was uh, Joseph had directed him to go to Texas. And of course, Texas wasn't a state as we are now. It was a republic. Um, and... Uh, so, uh, so he went to Zodiac, Texas. So most of this information I get is from Mel Johnson. Uh, he's a, a wonderful historian and he wrote the book, The Life and Times of John Pierce Hawley, a Mormon Ulysses of the American West. Now, most of you, in fact, when I, when I first interviewed Mel, I, would, I had never heard of John Pierce Hawley. Um, he's, he's kind of an interesting character because not only did he join with the Whiteites for a time, but then he left and joined the Brighamites in Utah. There's a questionable tie to whether he was in the Mountain Meadows Massacre or if his gun was used and he wasn't there. But then he left the, the Brighamites and joined the, the Josephites, uh, the RLDS church. So he really had quite a view of, of three different branches 
of the restoration. So um, he founded the city of Zodiac, Texas, which is no longer in existence. It's near Fredericksburg, Texas. Uh, he was ordained an apostle um, in 1841. And then um, Brigham Young kept trying to get him to come to Utah. And he was said, no, Joseph Smith sent me to Texas. I'm going to stay here. And, uh, and so then he kind of became the president of what he called the Church of Christ from 1844 to 1858. Um, after his death, many of his followers ended up joining in the RLDS church. Uh, one of the amazing things to me um, and to Mel was um, John Pierce Holly built the first temple west of the Mississippi. Uh, it was the Zodiac Temple. Of course, the building's no longer in existence. It's been torn down. Um, but uh, the RLDS church actually owns the temple records where they performed Nauvoo era endowments and ceilings. And so uh, uh, Lyman White was a polygamist and he believed in, in polygamy. And so um, if you want to know more, I don't want to spend too much time on here, but uh, I've got a link there to, to my interview with, with uh, Mel Johnson. And uh, of course he gets into LDS history and our LDS history too. So that's, that's a very interesting uh, interview, um, and and it's the only one I've ever known about. Was where anybody knew anything about Lyman White? So, so that's kind of a fun fun interview there. Uh, the next person we have is James Strang, and uh, so we often refer to them as the Strangites. Um, so James Strang is interesting in the fact that um, on the day that Joseph Smith was killed. James Strang claimed an angel ordained him to be prophet on the night of Joseph Smith's death. So um, there's also kind of a letter of ordination um, that uh, is a little bit disputed. Um, but at any rate, so James Strang uh, started what he called the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, which sounds a lot like the LDS Church. And so you can see why it's <laughs> why we're trying to refer to these as Strangites and Brighamites and things, because it just makes it a little bit easier. The one difference between his church name and the LDS church name is uh, the LDS church has a ladder dash small d day, and there's a ladder space day. That's the only difference in the names of the spelling. Um, and so uh, James Strang first uh, was on a mission in Vorey, Wisconsin, when... Um, or near Vori, I guess. That's kind of where the congregation is now. Um, Joseph had sent him on a mission to establish uh, kind of a, a settlement there. And um, then after, after some time, he migrated back east to Beaver Island, Michigan. And um, so James Strang, in a lot of ways, imitated Joseph Smith. He translated several plates including the Vori plates and the book of the law of the Lord. There's another one that I'm my names escaping me right now. Um, but so he translated several uh, books of scripture. Um, he initially rejected polygamy. And then when he translated the book of the law of the Lord, uh, it said that uh, he embraced, he, he said you could have up to four wives. And so that was the limit was just four wives. Uh, William Smith, I think, kind of influenced him. Um, the early church uh, leader, John C. Bennett, was also part of the Strangites and probably encouraged him to uh, embrace polygamy. Um, he was assassinated on Beaver Island, Michigan, and the adherents were, were scattered. Um, a lot of times in the LDS church, we talk about the, the pioneers and, and the deprivations that they faced, but very few know that the, uh, the Strangites suffered severe persecution. Um, Strang was shot uh, and he lived a few weeks uh, before, before he succumbed to his wounds. And, uh, and, but he never named a successor. So one of the interesting things, because he didn't, uh, Strangites no longer have any apostles or a prophet anymore. Um, this picture here is with uh, Bill Shepard. He's, uh, he's a high priest, kind of the leader uh, in Vorey, Wisconsin, 
and a wonderful historian. He's a former uh, JWHA president, John Whitmer Historical Association president, and just one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. Um, some interesting things about them, they, they worship on Saturday. They're uh, Seventh-day Sabbatarians, I think they call themselves. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They believe that Joseph was the father of Jesus, so that's pretty, pretty interesting theology. Um, there are actually three main groups. Uh, of course, they all claim to be official Strangite groups. Um, and so, uh, so technically, Bill's in, just in one of the, the three Strangite schisms. And I've got several links there um, that you can learn a little bit more about the Strangites. So, but they're, they're still in existence. They still meet weekly. And uh, Bill is a, a super great guy. Next group we have is the Sydney Rigdon William Bickerton group. So of course, Sydney's on the left, William Bickerton's on the right. Uh, we often refer to them as the Bickertonites. And uh, Daniel Stone is an amazing author. Um, he's kind of the Richard Bushman of the Bickertonite groups. He's uh, recently got his PhD in history and he's a wonderful fellow too. Um, just very enthusiastic. So the Bickertonites are based in Monongahela, Pennsylvania. Basically, just to back up a little bit, when um, Joseph was running for president, um, he asked Sidney to be his vice presidential candidate. And there's an electoral college rule where it's advantageous if you don't live in the same state. And so Sidney established a residency near Pittsburgh. And uh, so he was in Pittsburgh when... Um, when he received news that, that Joseph Smith had been killed. Uh, and uh, so Sydney came back to Nauvoo and Brigham Young at the time was on a mission in Massachusetts, I believe. And so, uh, so the apostles gathered uh, and then there was kind of a, a famous um, meeting where Sydney wanted to be the guardian of the church and Brigham said, no, the 12 are going to take over. And then everybody voted and, and uh, most people sided with Brigham. Sydney went back to Pittsburgh and started his own church, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Children of Zion. Um, I think it got up to about 300 uh, in the congregation. William Bickerton was one of those converted by Sydney Rigdon. Uh, but Sydney had Sydney was very erratic, and that's probably why uh, the people in Nauvoo didn't want him to lead because they knew how erratic he was. And so, after a few years, uh, the Sydney basically just kind of quit leading the church. And so William Bickerton kind of took over the the pieces. William was a, a former coal miner um, there, and. Um, there was a time where actually uh, William Bickerton did join the LDS church for a very short time. I think it was about nine months. And then in 1852, when uh, Brigham Young and Orson Pratt announced that polygamy was uh, an official doctrine of the church, then William Bickerton said, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to be part of that. And so, so he kind of picked up the pieces of, uh, of Sidney Rigdon's church. And so, what I understand is they believe that Joseph Smith was the first prophet, Sidney Rigdon was the second prophet, and then William Bickerton was the third. Um, it's kind of an interesting story. They, even after William Bickerton took over, they kind of had a little bit of a schism. Um, William was accused of adultery, or I shouldn't say adultery, inappropriate relations with a woman. Basically, he was alone with a woman and and got accused of adultery over that. And uh, Daniel doesn't think that it, it, it was actually an adulterous affair, but it was kind of scandalous. Uh, I believe William was about 60 years old and this woman, Trifina Taylor, if I remember her name, was about in her 20s. And so William didn't see any problem with that, but people were like, you shouldn't be alone with a woman. So, so the, the church is actually split there for a time, and uh, a guy named William Cadman became the, the leader of the Bickertonite church. <laughs> and then um, 
eventually William Bickerton and William Cadman kind of reconciled, but the idea was William Bickerton no longer was the leader, it was Cadman. And so in a way, the, the Bickertonite church has kind of erased William Bickerton, even though he was a, a he was the guy who kind of kept Sydney's church going. So um, they claim to be the third largest restoration church, I believe about 10,000 members. Um, they still practice speaking in tongues to this day. Um, I know Steve Pineacre has attended some of their services in Florida. I was going to go over spring break, but my travel plans got just were terrible. And so I need to, I'm still, I know they have a, a congregation in Florida. I know they're big in Michigan. Um, and that's where Daniel lives in Detroit and, um, and Mahongahela, Pennsylvania. I believe they have a congregation in Arizona and I'm going to make it out there because I want to attend. Steve, Steve uh, said it was quite a, quite a lively group and uh, I definitely want to attend. It sounds like a lot of fun. So um, some of the highlights, Alice Cooper, and I might have the Alice Cooper's grandfather. It might be Ether Moroni Fernier, which how much more of a Book of Mormon name can you get than that? Um, his, so Alice Cooper's grandfather was the church president uh, for a time. Um, Alice is no longer a member of the church, but he was he was raised with the Book of Mormon. They, they strongly believed in the Book of Mormon. They do not accept the Doctrine and Covenants anymore. Although William Bickerton really was a big proponent of baptism for the dead and Joseph Smith's Civil War revelations. And so, but they, 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 don't, they don't believe in the Doctrine and Covenants anymore. So um, I've got a couple of links there to uh, some other interviews that, that I've done, especially with Daniel Stone. So Daniel is, is, is pretty amazing. So um, the fourth one here we have is Alpheus Cutler, known as the Cutlerites. And so uh, this is another interesting group. If you're there in Independence, you're probably familiar with this group. They're just a few blocks south of the Independence Temple. Um, unfortunately, I was out there. I've got some pictures uh, that I wanted to share. Um, so they were reorganized in 1853 by Alpheus Cutler. That is their church slash temple. From what I understand, the, the main floor is the, uh, the church and then the upper, the upstairs is kind of their, uh, their temple. Um, so Alpheus Cutler, oh, they're called the Church of Jesus Christ. And oh, by the way, the Bickertonites are also called the Church of Jesus Christ. So it's the exact same name. And uh, you can see why it's very, very hard to, um, to keep these straight if you don't <laughs> use another kind of a naming convention. So um, Alpheus Cutler left Brigham Young to start the Church of Jesus Christ. I believe it was April 6, 1853, although I saw another thing that said October. So that they might not be correct, but I, that's, that's what I understand. Um, they once had a congregation in Minnesota, but they're down to about nine total members. I've got a picture of two of those members, and I can't remember the gentleman's name. His wife was a Virginia Lane. She gave me a tour of their of their church. Maybe I'll jump ahead there really quick. So I got to see the, the Cutlerite Chapel. Um, from what I understand, if you can kind of see, there's a little bit of a line here. I think they've got a um, baptismal font in the floor. At least that's what I've been told. Um, but it's a it's a very small building. Um, but uh, Virginia was just one of the friendliest people. I asked her if she would be on a podcast, and she would not. So. I'm telling you all of this from memory um, in my congregation with her. Um, and, you know, a lot of historians are like, wow, you could talk to a whole religion here. There's only nine members. Um, most of them are, are getting up in age, but they do have, and I can't remember if it's Virginia's grandson or somebody else's grandson in his thirties uh, that lives in Colorado. Um, they're not concerned about dying out um, if this grandson marries somebody, he could maybe keep keep it going. Um, but they they just meet together, you know. Um, 
so one of the interesting things, they're one of the few, I will say non-polygamous groups that actually still believes in temple work. Um, and so they, they do practice ceilings and endowments for the living only. Um, she told me that there's no marriage in heaven, so they don't do any endowments or ceilings for the dead. They still practice baptism for the dead, however, and they are strongly against uh, polygamy. So I've got a few other interviews with, I think, Stephen Shields and um, or who the other one was with there that, that talk a little bit about the, the Cutlerites. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the inside of their church there. Uh, topic five, Granville Hedrick, known as the Hedrickites. And so um, Granville was an early, um, was baptized in 1843, just a year before Joseph Smith's death uh, in Wood Woodford County, Illinois. He joined with Brigham Young for a time and then um, uh, had a revelation, well, that they were supposed to return to Missouri and um, that they were, they were going to get the temple lot. So they're known as the Church of Christ Temple Lot. Um, so they actually own, well, this is one of the interesting things. They actually own, originally Joseph Smith had planned 24 temples in both Independence and Kirtland. And, um, but they own the original lot. Um, let me see, I'm going to skip ahead of here a little bit. If I can find it. Oh, I must not have put it in there, darn it. I can't believe I didn't put that picture in there. There's a picture they have where they're laying out the, the people are standing around the foundation of the, um, of the original temple in Missouri that of course was never actually built. But uh, so Granville Hedrick uh, was an ordained an apostle by Hiram Page. Uh, and became leader of the Church of Christ in July of 1863. Um, the interesting thing is, even though he had the revelation to return to Missouri to claim the temple lot, his brother, and I can't remember his brother's name, um, actually returned and bought the, the land where the original temple lot was. Um, and so they actually tried to rebuild the temple in the 1930s, um, and then the depression hit and they just didn't have any money. So most of this information I'm getting is from G, uh, our Gene Adams. Um, he's a, he's a LDS, but he's probably the best expert on the temple lot. Once again, when I spoke to them, um, just like with the Cutlerites, they did not want to speak on camera, um, but were very friendly. They reject the doctrine and covenants in favor of the book of commandments. Um, they occasionally practice speaking in tongues they have apostles that lead their church, but often drop below 12. Uh, I believe they're less than 12 right now. Their original building has been burned, burned twice by arson, which is just uh, terrible to me. And there's a, a link to my interviews with, uh, with Gene Adams. Um, this is a picture of the first um, Church of Christ Temple lot, the first building from 1889 to 1898. Um, this picture here on the right is interesting because this is the son of Granville Hedrick uh, standing in front of that, that original building. You can see how small it was. Um, and so that one burned, and it was by arson. I think it was an irate uh, member of the congregation that burned it down. Um, back in the 30s, uh, they tried to build the temple lot, and you can see uh, there's a big hole here, and uh, they were they were putting in the footings here. Um, Bishop Alma Frisbee, you could, they've got a picture here. They found two of the original stones that were used to mark the, uh, I believe the cornerstones or, or at least some sort of markers for the temple that were laid, I won't say by Joseph Smith, but uh, probably Oliver Cadre or whoever, the Whitmers, I think were, were big there. And uh, in fact, this one has a W on it. I'm sure that's one of the Whitmer brothers probably marked that stone. Um, so it was very sad. They, they decided to build this and then the depression hit. Um, one of the most famous residents of independence is President Harry Truman. 
And so the interesting thing was that they just had this gigantic hole. And of course, when he, um, well, he was president in the late forties, I believe. And uh, so when he was returning to independence, the city said, we don't want to have this eyesore anymore. We will pay to fill in the hole because they didn't want Harry Truman to see this ugly hole. <laughs> and so, uh, so the city, because they didn't have any money to, to even fill in the hole. And so the city uh, paid to have that in so that uh, Harry Truman, when he returned from his presidency, wouldn't see this big, ugly hole anymore. So that's kind of kind of interesting there. Um, so this is their new church. You can see the picture on the top right there. It was about 1990, if I remember right, somewhere around there, uh, a disgruntled former member with uh, mental issues uh, set fire to, to the church. And so uh, that's the church that burned down. Um, it's since been replaced. Um, this guy here, Randy Sheldon, is an elder. Uh, his father, I think, was William Sheldon. He was an apostle. I think one of the head apostles. I wouldn't be surprised if Randy becomes an apostle in the future. Um, but they were, they were very fun and very nice. And of course, they have a nice, nicer church now than they've ever had. Um, and so, so that's a, it's nice. So <clears throat> that brings us to um, kind of some modern schismatic groups. So these aren't in any particular order. Uh, mostly, I, originally I was going to be like the order that I interviewed these people. And so, um, so we'll jump in. I see there's some people in the chat. Let me see if there's anything. Um, oh yeah, Johnny Page. Okay. So uh, anyway, um, all right, so let's talk about, oh, I need to fix my slide here. Okay, so the first group that I'd like to talk about is the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so uh, I interviewed Jim Van Cannon. Uh, this is kind of interesting because even within this, we've gotten a schism. So Jim Van Cannon was a, for, was a former counselor of the Remnant Church of G, uh, and is now, they've had a schism, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now he's the prophet of the everlasting church of Jesus Christ in the latter days. So the remnant church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, is basically an RLDS breakoff. They started in 2000. Frederick Larson was the first prophet and they believed in lineal succession. Um, Fred Larson is a descendant of Joseph Smith. Uh, they were strongly against female ordination in 1984 when the RLDS church allowed women to be ordained. Um, a lot of people were very upset. And the remnant church is just one of many uh, independent branches, especially there in independence. Um, I like to think of the, the remnant church as kind of old style RLDS, where they were not only strongly against polygamy, but they still believe Joseph was a monogamist. Um, one of the big things that in their group is they're trying to restart uh, consecration. And uh, you can see my uh, link there. Um, they had a secession crisis following Fred Larson's death on April 26, 2019. Um, Fred was in his 90s when he passed away. And the current president is uh, Terry Patience. Um, it was kind of interesting because I was watching this live on Facebook and it was like Brigham Young versus Sidney Rigdon on Facebook live. And you could kind of see the, the back and forth. Um, it, was, it was just really, really interesting to watch that uh, secession crisis. And uh, so I know there were some very hard feelings between Terry and Jim. And uh, I've been trying to get both of them back on, but I haven't been able to get them on yet, but um, I'm working on that. So. So anyway, that was just interesting to kind of see, just like with the um, Brigham Young and, and uh, Sidney Rigdon, um, the, the president of the Corner of the Twelve took over like Brigham Young did, and then uh, Jim split and, and started his own church. Um, another group are what we call independent polygamists. So on the right here, you can see Ann Wilde. Um, She's an independent polygamist. 
And uh, on the left is a guy named uh, David Patrick. I'll talk more about him because he's not independent. He's, he's, he's affiliated with a, a different church. But uh, the independent polygamists are probably the largest, they're larger than any one single branch. Um, and probably even bigger than say the bigger tonight's, I would say. Um, they don't have any official structure. One of the interesting things about independent polygamists is, you know, in the LDS church, especially we talk about lines of authority. And, and uh, one of the arguments with the uh, fundamentalist Mormons, if I can use that term, is that priesthood is independent of the church. And they point to the fact that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery received the priesthood before the church was organized. And so, uh, so they use that idea. And so when a person gets excommunicated, say from the LDS church, um, that they believe that doesn't stop their priesthood authority, especially um, when, you know, a lot of the early um, polygamists got their second endowment or second anointing. And, uh, and so with that, they believe that gave them the power to seal, to seal anybody. And so you, you, you can hear, especially in LDS history, that a, a bishop would seal two people in a dance together because he had the sealing power. And Brigham Young wanted to really rein that in. Um, and so he said, no, you can't do that without my permission. So uh, at any rate, um, Ogden, so uh, Ann Wilde's husband, Ogden Kraut, He's highly influential among all polygamous groups, writing 65 books. Um, David Patrick, he's an apostle for the for Christ Church, and we'll talk about more about his group in just a minute. But he thought it would be great to have an episode um, to celebrate uh, the 50th anniversary of the publishing of the book Jesus Was Married. Um, so this is a first edition book here, and the current edition uh, by Ogden Kraut that is still very, very influential among polygamists. So Anne was, was Ogden's secretary for a while. They, they were secretly married. It's kind of interesting. I don't know exactly when Anne, she's, she doesn't want to say, but uh, you know, as you put, because um, Ogden was excommunicated, I believe in the 1970s. Um, and Anne was secretly married to him for, more than 30 years. Um, Ogden, I'm trying to remember when Ogden died. Uh, I know it was before the year 2000. And Anne started a group called the um, Principal Voices, which was to try to promote polygamy as a not a terrible lifestyle, as, as a lot of people think. And, um, and I believe it was her activities around the 2002 Olympics, when the Olympics were in Salt Lake City, she was granting a lot of interviews. And I think that's probably when she got excommunicated. Um, so anyway, she, I've had her on a couple of times. This was the second time um, with, with that book. So um, she's very knowledgeable, has ties to pretty much every polygamous group. Um, and, and she's very interesting. Third one I thought we could talk about is the FLDS Church. And so um, they're also a Brighamite breakoff. Now, one of the interesting things about fundamentalist Mormonisms, uh, and, and of course, I'm talking about Brighamite breakoffs here, of course. Um, the FLDS Church was not formally organized until 1984. And Rulin Jeffs is Warren's father. He was the first prophet and he knew Gordon B. Hinckley as a young man, which I thought was pretty interesting. So following, and even before Rulin's death, uh, Rulin was kind of suffering from, it sounds like dementia and that sort of thing. And so his son Warren took over leadership and Warren is currently um, in jail. That's a, that's a picture of his mugshot from, uh, from Texas, I believe. Um, or it could be in Utah, I'm not sure, because he's been arrested both places. In, in Utah, he, he was able to uh, not be convicted, but it, it was in Texas. So, so he moved from Texas uh, to, or from Utah to Texas. There was a big raid at the YFC 
uh, y, YFZ stands for Yearning for Zion Ranch. They have an FLDS temple. It was actually a false report that led Texas authorities to raid the temple. They separated their children from the parents. And uh, he's currently in the, a Texas jail for assisting in the rape of a child, Elissa Wall. Um, Elissa was 15 years old and was, so one of the interesting things about the FLDS church, which is very different from the, uh, from the other fundamentalist Mormons is Rule and Jeffs really like the, the idea of one man rule. And a lot of the other fundamentalists believe, well, if you've got the sealing power, then you can seal anybody. And, you know, as long as the, the sealer believes that you can marry two people, then that's fine. And so Rulin really wanted to consolidate that sealing power and, and have what's called one man rule. And so Warren abused that and really, um, he, would, he would say, so for example, Alyssa was supposed to marry her cousin who was I think two or three years older that she hated. And he was just, it, there's a book, um, I'm trying to remember what the name of the book is, but Alyssa wrote. Um, and it, it's just, it's a terrible, terrible situation. So, um, Warren is still leading the church from jail. The church is really in disarray. And um, Jeff is still excommunicating people from men, especially men from jail. And their, their church has really fallen on hard times uh, with Warren in jail. So Lindsay Hanson Park uh, is kind of my expert on that. And I've, I've got a link there to that interview. Um, she She's great on everything, but we in our interview, we talked a lot about uh, uh, FLDS church. Um, this is another terrible story. We're going to do about three terrible stories in a row. Um, this one's in the news lately. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell don't believe they're polygamous as far as I know, um, but uh, they're an LDS break off based up near Rexburg, Idaho. They're part of the prepper movement where, you know, they're into end times and have your guns ready and the world's going to end at any time. And so Chad Daybell was an influential writer of visions prior to his arrest. Um, Chad and Lori married soon after both of their previous spouses were deceased under suspicious circumstances. Lori's first husband was killed by her brother, which is kind of weird. And then her brother died. Um, they have some really strange beliefs that children were possessed by devils and became zombies. Um, I think Lori's child was a autistic or something. And anyway, uh, the children were missing for months. Uh, Lori and Chad uh, got married and did a honeymoon in Hawaii and everybody was like, where's the children? And they were like, oh, they're fine. The bodies were discovered buried on Chad's property. So just recently in the news, Lori has had her legal status changed from incompetent to competent to stand trial. And trials are, of both of them are to take place soon. Um, I interviewed a guy named Christopher Blythe. Um, doc, uh, he's a professor at BYU and, and he kind of talked about that. So it's a, it's a very unpleasant story. Um, you know, I know we've got under the banner of heaven. I don't even actually have them in my, in here. Um, there's another story about Jeff Lundgren. A, um, he is an RLDS break off, a very similar sort of story. Um, he believed that the story of ne where Nephi killed Laban um, authorized him to have a hit list. And so he had a, a hit list of several prominent RLDS leaders. Uh, he killed a family of five in Ohio and uh, was never remorseful at all. He was executed by lethal injection in 2006. I have an upcoming interview uh, with uh, Bill Russell from the Community of Christ, and he's going to give a few more details on that story. Um, Bill's really interesting because while he loathes, I don't think that's too strong of a word, Jeff Lundgren, he's also strongly against the death penalty and actually testified in an attempt to save Jeff from the death penalty. Um, but uh, of course he was executed back in um, 2006. 
Um, there's a link uh, to uh, Bill's Sunstone talk. I think it's from 1993 where he talks about, uh, about this story of uh, Jeff Lundgren killing this, this family of five in Ohio. So time to move on to happier topics. <laughs> um, the remnant movement. Um, so we've talked about the remnant church of Jesus Christ, which was Jim Van Cannon and that group. Well, this is the remnant movement with Denver Snuffer, not to be confused. The remnant church with Jim Van Cannon is a RLES break off or a Josephite break off. Denver Snuffer is a Brighamite breakoff. Um, one of the interesting things is Denver says that, he, that God didn't ask him to set up a church. And he doesn't like to be called a prophet, even though he basically functions as a prophet. So Denver was excommunicated in, in 2013 over the book, Passing the Heavenly Gift. He claims to meet with Jesus often. He has published his own version of the Bible Got a copy on my shelves here somewhere. And where uh, sometimes Joseph would give sermons and he would say, well, this scripture means this. And so uh, Denver would take those and add and add what Joseph Smith said into his version of the Bible. So it's like the inspired version of the Bible that the RLDS use plus. <laughs> and uh, so they've recently published that. So. Denver's had many revelations. He rejects uh, DNC 132 and many other revelations. Um, he used to be more LGBT friendly or polygamy friendly than he is now, but he claims that God has told him that uh, those, those things aren't of God. He now believes Joseph was a monogamist. He didn't used to believe that. In fact, we talked about that in my interview with Denver. And one of the interesting things about um, Denver, because it's not a church, you don't have to quit your join, your church to join his movement. Um, you know, he is talking about building a temple one day. Um, he's based here in Sandy, Utah, not far from my house. Very friendly guy. And uh, so that's, so he's kind of, uh, you know, this has just been since about 2013 that his church has started. Uh, another break off is the reborn LDS church. So uh, this guy in the red shirt here in the middle, a guy named John Pratt, he was the guy I interviewed. Interesting thing about John, he joined with Denver and he's and he was he's a descendant of Parley P. Pratt. And uh, so uh, so John Pratt is, is quite an interesting character. Uh, this person on the left here holding the, the gold plates here is Mauricio Berger, and he is uh, based in Brazil. And he claims that the angel Raphael came, um, came to him, ordained him a prophet and gave him the actual gold plates that um, Joseph Smith had. And so you can see these, these are loose pages, but over here, they're bound pages. And so, um, he has translated a portion of the uh, sealed plates. And uh, I know he's been in some, um, in a lawsuit with the LDS church because they don't want him to refer to it as the um, sealed book of Mormon. And so they, they've got a, you can download a copy um, over the internet, but they're, they're not supposed to sell the sealed portion due to a lawsuit. But uh Anyway, there's, there's supposed to be, I, I joked with John because John told me in the interview that um, he was to be a witness of a, of a second sealed portion that was going to be translated. Well, the unfortunate thing is I interviewed John last summer, it was June or July, and, and I told John it was going to take me some time because I'm always slow getting these interviews out, it's a lot of work, and um, he passed away in October um, from COVID, and uh Unfortunately, he wasn't vaccinated, so that was so he was not able to to be a witness for this second um, sealed portion. And so I was really sad to hear that. But uh, I've got a, a link to that interview. He talks a little bit more about Mauricio Berger and John's an astrophysicist. One of the other interesting things is he thinks that he's figured out uh, that the first vision took place on March 23rd. If I remember, I think that's the right date. 1820 
Um, he's, he's made some calculations and, and some uh, calendars and sorts of things. But anyway, um, so, so that's, that's the, the Brazil group, the Reborn LDS Church. Um, the House of Aaron. So this is kind of an interesting group because they are very, very loosely affiliated um, as, as a Brighamite breakoff. So they were organized in the 1950s by a guy by the name of Maurice Glenn Denning. So Maurice hailed from the Midwest and uh, his wife had asthma. And so they were trying to, to move west and, and accidentally ended up in Salt Lake City. And, uh, and Maurice had had several visions and revelations about the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And a lot of people in the Midwest just thought he was kind of crazy. And, uh, and so when he got to Utah and they were talking about, the, you know, the 12 tribes and the lost tribes and, and he fit right in. Um, and they were like, hey, join the church. And so he joined the church for the LDS church for a short time. But then he kept having these visions um, and he really wanted, he really liked the LDS idea of consecration. And so they moved out to central Western Utah, right on the Nevada border. Uh, it's very remote, it's a long drive. And uh, so they've, kind of, they've started a consecration society. So one of the interesting things, especially here in Utah, when you talk about consecration societies, a lot of times you think that, um, that that's tied up with polygamy, but not with this group. They strongly, they not only strongly reject the uh, polygamy, but they no longer believe in the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine and Covenants. So um, they're more of Messianic Christians. I was out there last fall, I think it was, and um, they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. And so they celebrate a lot of the Jewish holidays. They worship on Saturday on the seventh day. Um, and a uh, very friendly group, very small group, probably 50 to 70 in their community, I'd say. You technically don't have to be a member of their church if you want to participate in consecration. Um, but uh, so this person here, John Conrad, he's the leader of the uh, of the House of Aaron. His father led before him. And then before that was, uh, they referred to Maurice Glendening as Bishop Glendening. So they kind of still use some LDS terminology. Um, I'm trying to remember, there was a vision where it was either Nephi or Moroni that appeared to Maurice. And so, so they kind of still have some ties, but they don't, they don't claim to be Mormons at all. They don't claim to be really affiliated with the LDS church at all, but there's definitely some influence uh, with this group. Um, so, so uh, a lot of scholars kind of consider them a restoration group, but they don't consider themselves a restoration group. So they're, they're, they're fun people. The next group we have is Christ Church. So I mentioned David Patrick uh, on the right here. He's the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Benjamin Schaefer on the left in the, in the green. Um, he is in the Quorum of Seventy for Christ Church. They are basically a Brighamite breakoff. They believe polygamy is a very important uh, principle. Um, <clears throat> Both David and Benjamin told me they're personally monogamists, but they, they really support the idea of polygamy. Um, they support the Adam God doctrine. And uh, so that was kind of interesting. And they, they refer to it as kind of a pyramid. They've got this pyramid temple. They've actually got two of them. One is in Southern Utah. I wanna make it out there. And then the other one is in Nevada. I'm trying to get the temple matron um, on my podcast, but it's, she's very remote in Nevada, so uh, we'll see. But uh, but they're they're very interesting. As you can see, they dress normally, not like the uh, the pioneer of the FLDS church. They were founded in April of 1978, just two months before the LDS revelation on priesthood in June of 1978. So they're very 
I hate to say normal, but they seem very normal, especially when you compare them to say the FLDS church. I know uh, David's a financial advisor and uh, Benjamin's a lawyer. So you can see more uh, at that link there. Um, next group we have is the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. So this is Christine and David Fairman. They are co-presidents and co-prophets. Um, this is another really new group. They are basically a Brighamite breakoff. They're based in Ohio. Um, David had his first revelation in 2015 and, uh, and started the church around 2016. They uh, basically... In, in, well, they're different than Denver Snuffer, but like Denver Snuffer, you can um, you can be a part of their movement without leaving your church. So um, you don't have to quit your church to join them. Right now, they only have internet services. They don't have a physical location, so they will hold a sacrament meeting. Um, they're also kind of Messianic Christians, kind of like the House of Aaron. They celebrate a lot of the Jewish holidays. Uh, they ordain women. They have what they refer to as the Melchizedek priesthood for men and the Magdalene priesthood for women. Um, and the Aaronic priesthood, they have, um, of course, the Aaronic priesthood for men and the Miriam, no. Yeah, I think that's right. Miriam priesthood uh, for women. Um, so they are very open to LGBT members. Um, they allow polygamists to join they allow lay members to receive revelation. They have a, an extremely open canon. Um, they'll even accept non-Christian scripture as like, if you believe something out of the, the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or you know any book of scripture that speaks to you, that that can be your personal scripture. So they're very, very open to um, lots of different revelations. Uh, they're, I think they're pretty small still, but they, they claim to have members from all over the world. That's just one of my recent uh, interviews that I, that I just published. Um, the next one, this one I have not published yet. Um, I know Steve Pineacres had a, a Matthew Gill on, and I haven't been able to listen to that one yet. But uh, So this is Matthew Gill. He's the prophet of the restored branch of Jesus Christ. He also had a lawsuit uh, <laughs> against him. Um, so he's an LDS breakoff. He resigned, I want to say back in about 2005, based in, we would say Derbyshire, but he says Derbyshire, England. He was also ordained by the angel Raphael, similar to the, uh, the Brazil group. Um, he, so he's translated some plates, uh, claims that Jaredite relatives built Stonehenge so he's translated the book of Jeronek and a few other books of scripture. Um, he's firmly against polygamy. Believes that Joseph Smith was a monogamist. One of Matthew's earliest revelations came when he was only 12 years old. In 2005, he had an angelic encounter and resigned from the LDS church. Uh, mostly it sounded like he didn't like the way that the sacrament was being passed. Um, he says they have about 15 to 20 members, but 20 to 30 follow online services. So he's kind of an internet uh, church as well. And um, I was just starting to edit that uh, this past weekend here. I'll probably have that up in a month or two. And uh, so he's, he's very interesting. Um, he's got other books of scripture besides uh, the book of Jaranek. Oh, and then the, with a website for his church is restoredbranch.com. All right, and now I'm gonna finally finish up here with some other polygamous groups. Um, I haven't actually been able, I've been trying to get Cody Brown on, but uh, he's part of the group called the Apostolic United Brethren. Um, they were started by a guy named Rulin Allred. And uh, they're, um, the most famous member is, is Cody Brown, and uh, Anne talked a little bit about, about them. Uh, following the third manifesto in about the 1930s, um, that's kind of when the All Red group um, started the Apostolic United Brethren. Of course, they believe in polygamy. Um, they're very, 
a lot of times, uh, like if you watch the show, especially when they lived in Utah, well, to be honest, uh, I found Cody Brown's house. It's only about three miles from my house. Um, they, unlike the FLDS church, they look very modern. You would not be able to distinguish them from a, a regular LDS member um, if you didn't know that they were polygamous. Um, and uh, so uh, Anne, Anne talked a little bit about, about them at that link. Um, the LeBaron group, Ervil LeBaron, um, he had a hit list uh, that included uh, the president of the LDS Church, Spencer W. Kimball. Um, and uh, he, his wives actually killed Ruin Allred, who was part of the Apostolic United Brethren. And he shot at Gerald Peterson, who is a member of Christ Church. This is in the 70s. Um, Ervil died in prison um, and... I remember when I asked Anne a, a little bit about Ervil LeBaron, and she said, oh, he, he was at my house. He sat on my couch. Um, she thinks he might have been doing uh, some reconnaissance on Ogden Kraut, her husband. And she said, but he used an assumed name. And she said, if I'd have known who he was, I would have been really scared, but he used a different name. Um, so anyway, he was a, he was a bad guy. Um, they actually have a, a group in Mexico. Uh, you probably heard, well, it's been three or four years now, about a, a Mexican drug cartel that uh, targeted some Mormon polygamists. It was the LeBaron group. Um, I don't, it's just kind of a crazy story. So anyway, that the LeBaron group, they're just kind of kind of out there. Um, and then the, uh, the, the last group that I want to talk a little bit about is the Centennial Park group. So um, the Centennial Park were part of the FLDS, and they split from the FLDS over one-man rule. I kind of talked a little bit about that earlier. And uh, so the FLDS and the Centennial Park have a, a real rivalry um, because they were, you know, they're basically cousins and they're they were very, their communities are close together. So they kind of had to like separate communities. So um, anyway, and talks a little bit more about that. So um, if you want to know more about these, I, I can't recommend enough both John Hamer's book, but, but Stephen Shields, uh, Diversion Paths of the Restoration. It's got 500, over 500 uh, restoration expressions. And the book includes both new and extinct groups. Uh, it's only published as an ebook because the book is so large they just couldn't get it into the print. Um, it's published by Signature Books, and, and I've got a link there. And uh, if you have any, I'll open it up now for for questions or confirmations or uh, questions, and uh, you can contact me. I'm not very good on Twitter, so if you're a Twitter person, I, it would better be better if you emailed me. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I'll stop sharing and uh, open it up for any questions that you guys have. I hope you enjoyed our conversation about these different schismatic groups. I guess if you have any questions, you're going to have to ask me. Here goes. If you like what we're doing at Gospel Tangents, please support us. Go to gospeltangents.com and you can get full interviews as well as transcripts if you'd like those. So click here to subscribe and over here you can see some of our other great videos. Thanks again.